All righty, I think the recording is on, the timer is on, we can start. Hi everyone, my name is Marek Zmysłowski. Um, I'm pre-recording this, uh, and even if I was live, I would be speaking to a laptop anyway, so I can just hope you're gonna laugh at my jokes. <laughs> I will be telling you today about stories from the last eight years of my life. Uh, I spent I spent the time running different type of businesses in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I wanna share with you what what this amazing continent has uh, has taught me really about um, about running business. So let's let's jump right in without any delay. Uh, first of all, I need to explain myself. Why is another white dude <laughs> talking about Africa? Weren't there enough of those? Um, so I moved to Nigeria 2012. I was working for Rocket Internet, a big uh, online company uh, in in the war in a global scale. Um, I guess after Alibaba and uh, and Amazon. Uh, one of the biggest uh, e-commerce groups in the world. We were launching a big e-commerce group uh, back then uh, focused on the African uh, continent called Jumia. I was working with them for uh, more than four years. And then I've opened my own company called Hotel Online, which became one of the biggest software uh, uh, companies for the Western Africa region. I was also advising Glovo on their expansion into Africa. We've launched uh, in Morocco, we've launched in Egypt, uh, in Kenya and in Ivory Coast. And for the last couple of years, I've been uh, I've been responsible for building the uh, African office for a Polish uh, uh, technology company called RTB House. I guess if we treated the RTB House African office as a separate entity, we would be one of the biggest uh, digital marketing agencies on the uh, on the continent. Most of my business in the last eight years have been focused on Africa, so I guess I have some legitimacy to talk about this continent. Uh, you'll be the judge. Uh, just to sum up a little bit of personal branding, um, my adventures in Africa have given me extremely positive and negative emotions because on one side, uh, the Jumia group, which we built with Rocket Internet, uh, we were able to do an IPO last year on NISA, on New York Stock Exchange. And on the other side, I got myself into some trouble with some powerful businessmen in Nigeria. And I've learned that in Nigeria, you can buy everything, including an, an arrest warrant. So for a couple months, I was actually on the <laughs> Interpol most wanted list, which turned out to be a funny story, but a scary at times. I've put this all into a, a book called Chasing Black Unicorns. If you haven't heard about it, check it out. All the money from the sales goes into a charity. I will tell about it in a second. But let's go back to the main topic. Um, the first lesson that I learned is about the hype. Uh, in business, oh my God, so much is depending dependent on so-called self-fulfilling prophecy which was the case uh, with Africa for so many years, the West was kind of apologetic about how they colonized Africa, how they decolonized it, which was even worse than the colonization itself on many as for many aspects. And then the famous aid, which, which I believe was worse, uh, Africa would be better without the aid than with, but that's a topic on another story. But then at some point, the, the PR of Africa has been slowly changing. Africa has been shown as a, as a potential for, for making business. And the self-fulfilling prophecy started working in the other way. Once you say it's getting better, it will attract money, it will attract investors and entrepreneurs, and they will actually make it better. Uh, but it's not as beautiful as it always seems. Because on one side, you see that the uh, demographics of Africa are absolutely exploding but we live in the fourth industrial revolution age when the population is not really your strength anymore. It might be your liability. Uh, on, uh, I'm, I'm, I have a point here, so bear with me. Then on the other side, what was communicated by all those you know, United Nations data, big four consulting companies like KPMG or McKinsey's, they were saying that middle class is also skyrocketing. Africa is growing not only because of demography, not only because of natural resources, but also because of internal demand for goods and services. But it wasn't really, um, because then you go deeper into the data and you realize that the definition of, of a middle class in Africa is basically three times, you have to make three times less money to be defined as middle class in Africa than in, than in Europe. And then you realize once you get into data even deeper is that your total addressable market is way, way different than any macroeconomical data you could think of. And as an example, let me tell you about Nigeria, which is a country of close to 200 million people, uh, uh, most powerful or second most powerful, depending who makes the calculations, economy in Africa. 
But when you look at how many people are actually middle class or almost middle class according to European standards, you end up with a population of 2 million people. You essentially have Warsaw of people that make more than $9,000 per year. And you have to ask yourself a question. Is your product uh, cheap enough for people that make less than a couple hundred dollars per month to sell to them? Which is the, the biggest uh, elephant in the room is that Africa might be an amazing uh, market when you look at the next 20 or 50 years. But when you want to run a business and build a business in the next couple of years, you really want to look at your total addressable market. And it may be very, very tiny, much smaller than what you what you thought of. Um, another case is that there's a problem with transparency of data and any type of research. And you can't do any expansion without the proper research or data transparency, really, right? And I'm going to give you an example from my area, uh, startup investments. Year 2018, three independent companies tried to do a summary of how much money was put into uh, startups by the VCs in Africa. This shop Africa has came up with a number of $300 million, a little bit more than that. Uh, then, uh, I don't remember what was the second company, the Africa Report maybe, they estimated around $725 million. And Partech estimated $1 billion, $100 million. So imagine that difference. How can you even operate, estimate, and do a research, anything, where such a basic data like startups funding has such a big discrepancy between, uh, between three organizations trying to do uh, analytics? A uh, case from my, another case from my uh, my business is that when we were launching Jumia Travel, that was the online travel part uh, back then called Jovago in Nigeria, 2012, uh, McKinsey or KPMG did an analysis that there's around 4,000 hotels uh, in uh, in Nigeria, and then we arrived. We we've done our own expansion and we found 4,000 hotels just in Lagos, just in one city which tells you also a little bit uh, consulting companies that are doing the research from their New York office. Um, what else? Timing is something so cheesy and so obvious, we kind of forgot about it and take it as granted, but I could never see the timing aspect, aspect more clearly when we were entering the hospitality technology stage, first in Nigeria, then in Kenya, and then in uh, other Western and in Eastern African countries. In 2012, hotels were not online. Maybe 20% of them had, had a website. 10% uh, used any type of software to manage the hotel. 50% uh, were using an email. 50% uh, had a Wi-Fi, or even less, 30% had a Wi-Fi in a hotel. So if I came up with a product that is focused on business intelligence in a hotel, or I was selling some sort of a sophisticated tool where my client was the IT guy in a hotel, I would have a non-existent market. So the first product I could really market in the growing hospitality technology sector was to build an online travel agency because hotels didn't really care about what is internet, how I'm getting to the clients. But if the client arrived at the reception, they might pay me the commission. So that was a beautiful business model at that stage of, the, uh, of, of growth of the sector. Then, after a couple of years, when they've realized, okay, this thing called the internet is bringing us more and more uh, clients, people are booking us more and more often, they're sending more emails, we have to look at this internet thing. And that's the moment where uh, tools like channel managers, so software that allows the hotel to aggregate all those channels that are bringing their bookings into one place, that's where you could sell them. That's where you could sell the service of creating a website for the hotel, because they finally saw value in it. Uh, and that's where you could sell also a booking engine that is connected to the availability of your uh, of your hotel. And only after hotels realize that, okay, these online tools are allowing us to sell more and more rooms, there's only so many rooms you can sell because a hotel can't overbook, right? You can't just add 100 rooms to your hotel when you're already overbooked. Only after they've maximized the revenue potential, that's when the hotels decided, okay, maybe now let's look at our costs Let's increase our profits, not by maximizing revenue, but by decreasing the costs. So only then companies selling property management systems or any sort of ERP software even had a chance to, to operate and make any money in the region. Um, so that was the stage three of the growth, which was around 2017, 18 for me, where the total addressable market was big enough for a local company to make sense to exist. And then 
the last and final stage more sophisticated for me was when hotels were confident that technology is the way to go forward, that they even decided to invest in their own IT teams. That's where the hotels started hiring their own IT managers, online marketing managers. And obviously, once they have those people on the team, you can start offering them even more sophisticated tools like business intelligence or, or online marketing strategy optimization and so on and so on. So I, I couldn't see this more clearly than in the last eight years when I was looking at the hospitality sector growth. And when you're a startup, you gotta ask yourself a question. If the market is in stage one and I have a product for stage three, do I have enough money to survive until the total addressable market is, uh, you know, gets big enough and the market gets to stage three? That was very enlightening for me, although it might seem pretty obvious right now. Uh, another thing was uh, the total addressable market, which is related to not only the purchasing power of your clients, but also their education. So fun fact, this is a photo from Legos from three years ago. Uh, biggest roundabout in Lagos, Nigeria. Google is buying street billboards, explaining what google.com can do for you. So you can actually go there and search for information. So how many countries in the world you would expect that Google has to educate about the core business? So again, just because someone has a smartphone and even has the money doesn't mean he already knows that he can be your client. So education is a big part of, uh, of uh, market acquisition even for guys like Google, with their core product, like Google Search. Um, another thing which I've learned was just because I run an online, online company doesn't mean I also acquire my customers online. Um, we have been spending $5,000 on this street billboard on the left, which was next to the main road to the airport. And uh, the same amount of money could buy you a, a shop, a physical shop, and it's monthly rent. And people who are not so convinced to buying online would prefer to go to a shop and touch the product first. So our biggest competitor invested instead of street billboards, which we thought are building confidence, they've invested in a physical pickup point and they were growing faster than us. And then we had to change our strategy. And what have we done? We've opened our own physical stores, although we were an, an, an e-commerce business where you could uh, pick up your product. You could actually use the computer for free and buy something. We could also book hotels and flights physically just because this physical store for us was a, a, a client acquisition via education uh, channel. And uh, I've heard that Amazon is doing now that as well, also in the States, right? They're opening physical stores, probably for different reasons, but we were doing this way before. I think that was 2014. Um, another thing uh, is, again, total addressable market. I wanna give you two examples. First, I don't have a slide for this, but we've invested in a, in a startup called Stocking, Stocking Books which was basically the Audible for Africa. And uh, we've invested a lot in inventory, in books that uh, people in Nigeria or people in Kenya would read. We would look at an example of Audible or Audioteca in Poland, who is listening to audiobooks. Busy people, people that make more money, they commute and they wanna spend their time more effectively. They wanna listen to a book and acquire knowledge while commuting or working out or cleaning the house, for example. For example. So we've built, we've acquired inventory of books targeted at that people. But then after some time and after tens of thousands of dollars spent on marketing, we've realized that in Nigeria, those type of people, first of all, that group is small. And second of all, they're not that interested in listening to audiobooks. Who was listening to our audiobooks in Nigeria? Much, much younger kids, usually high school students, primary school students, just because for them, audiobook is the only way to consume knowledge. Because in the evening, the power goes off. Uh, they don't have books, they can't really read unless they have a candle, but they still have a battery on their phone. But those people needed, those kids, those students, they had much different purchasing power and they wanted to read much different books than those people we looked at in the, in the States or in Europe. Another case, Sunroof is a, is a solar power uh, company. I'm also a part of, um, recently invested in. And uh, this is a company from Sweden, now expanding, uh, Swedish, Polish, now expanding in Poland, Germany, and Western Europe mainly. Uh, but also we're looking at Africa because obviously Africa and the whole world needs to go into renewable energy sources. But then the product is the same, but you realize that people need you for totally different purposes. In Europe, people go solar because yes, they want to spend some, uh, some less money on electricity. They want to be green, they want to be ecological. Uh, they have more money to spend. 
But in Africa, no one really cares about ecology yet because they have other problems. But they need to go solar because if there is no solar, there's no power at all. Or if they have power, it can actually consume almost half of their budget, monthly budget. So the same product, two totally different uh, uh, target groups. Uh, that was also a big, big lesson uh, f for me when expanding from one country to another, that you might want to change a product or you might want to totally change your marketing, although the product is the same because you're addressing totally different group and, and you might want to change your price point. Uh, and just to finish up, something you will never be able to run away from is your country's reputation. Uh, people are tribal. They want to put you in a box. When you're an, an, an investor or an entrepreneur from another country entering a new country, they will ask you where you're from, what's your nationality. And whether you like it or not, everything they think about the country, they will connect that box with you. When I arrived in 2012 in Nigeria, uh, Poland was great because we had Lech Wałęsa, we have John Paul II, and we had Robert Lewandowski. The Nigeria is crazy about football, so I couldn't be in a better place. And obviously for those more educated people, Poland was also this example of a great economical progress uh, in the last couple of years because we just joined NATO, then we joined European Union, we were like second Ireland, right? You can imagine that right now, Poland's reputation is much different. And, and whether I like it or not, whether the foreign reputation is totally true or not, whether it's the view is distorted in one way or another, I don't want to get that discussion, you will never be able to run away from your country's reputation. So even if you're expanding internationally, they will always look at what your country represents. So. We should vote <laughs> uh, because what happens in your country will always affect you unless you change your nationality and your name. Uh, what else? Uh, I think I want to finish with this last uh, uh, observation. For me, this is like a great metaphor of a, of a, of a market in, in Nigeria. This is actually a highway, but this is how it looks because when there, there's a traffic jam, there are people coming into the highway and trying to sell you everything. And your business is like this car that tries to get through the highway, which is jammed. And there are two ways to go about it. You go the multi-corporation way, the big boy way. You hire a Mercedes G-Wagon with police in front of you with Kawashnikovs, and they will just shoot in the air. They will, they will just push the cars in front of you just to make away from you. You will get to the place you want using force, uh, a lot of money, uh, which doesn't really guarantee you success, always. And the smarter way is to be street smart, is to use your local Sherpas, your local advisors, and jump on a bike and just go, uh, go in a slalom, like, like this entrepreneur from, uh, from Europe. And many times, the most uh, dangerous competitors for a big multinational company or a well-funded startup from Europe are those small street smart startups from the local region that maybe don't have as much funding as you do but they would know way better how to spend that money and they way know the better, way better their growth hacks. What I've learned, however, is that when you do an expansion into Africa, there's absolutely no way to do your core business and then you do Africa, by the way, on the weekends, in the evenings. Um, and again, I'm generalizing, I'm talking about Africa as if this is one country. You choose one country as your first market and this is a separate project with your own country manager with 100% focus of those people doing this. Because if you do not do this, doesn't matter how well funded you are, you can lose all that money. I've seen multi corporations uh, funded in billions of dollars from Silicon Valley and from Europe uh, going back after 24 months because they just couldn't find a way to, uh, to materialize they, uh, their growth. Um, and that was my last uh, observation. If you guys are interested in what I was telling you about, check out my websites, check the book domain. Um, also, all the revenue from uh, the sales of the book goes to a charity, mayafoundation.com, which I've launched. You can find all the details on those domains. I'm already almost over time, so I'm going to finish here and uh, hope to chat to you in the Q&A section right now.